All right, excellent. So again, thank you to everyone who is tuning in both live and listening to the recording. My name is Dr. Splickle, podiatrist, human movement specialist, and founder of Noboso. Uh, so very excited to have this opportunity for a conversation and some education around the topic of symmetry, movement, gait, and then of course, sensory perception, and that can how that can help us potentially find balanced movement. So with all of our webinars, we do have them recorded. We give the opportunity for asking questions. So if you do have questions throughout, make sure that you type those into either the chat or the q and I'll be answering both of those. And then if you happen to be recording or listening to the recording, and then just send me an email um, or some sort of contact form. If you have any questions, I'd like to make myself available and we would be happy to answer any of your questions. So all the questions will be answered at the end. So as we jump into this again, my background, um, I am the founder of Nabo. So I'm the CEO, you know, all in with the sensory stimulation, but Outside of that, being a functional podiatrist and a human movement specialist, I spend a lot of my time studying, researching, and assessing gait, um, primarily dysfunctional gait or movement disorders. So this concept of symmetry, the, the place that my mind goes right away is to gait symmetry or asymmetries. And of course, how you can see that with, with certain movement disorders. But then, of course, this applies to all aspects of potential symmetry or lack of symmetry. And do we really even want to achieve a balanced body? Is it evolutionarily advantageous to have symmetry or to have asymmetry? Uh, in addition to private practice, Nafoso, I'm the founder of EBFA Global. So if this is your first time listening to any webinar through both myself or uh, Naboso, just know that EBFA Global is an education company that is um, based off of barefoot science and sensory stimulation. Uh, and I know that... Um, I think Dar's raising her hand. If you could just type in any of your questions or comments, if you have, and you're raising your hand, it's just easier if you type that in. All right. And then finally, in addition, I'm the author of Barefoot Strong, the book, which is available on Amazon. And then we also sell that through Naboso. So let's think about symmetry and this topic of symmetry. Of course, we're going to be speaking about movement symmetry, but from a human slash symmetry perspective, one thing when you think about symmetry and the development of us homo sapiens is that a lot of what is on our left side is built onto that right side. And what's actually interesting is that beauty is based off of symmetry. And when I was writing this PowerPoint yesterday, I actually got into some research articles and apps that you can actually take a picture of yourself or share a picture, and it will do all of these different measurements and tell you how symmetrical or asymmetrical your face is. And then oftentimes that actually translates into beauty. So those who have more symmetrical faces are actually perceived as more beautiful. I don't know even though you might think that some of the uniqueness is actually what creates beauty. But symmetry in us, from an aesthetic perspective, symmetry is actually desired because it's a way that we associate beauty. Now, symmetry or lack of symmetry is actually developed or starting to develop in utero. And we start to favor one side and the rotations that we turn, even the way that we come out of the womb is asymmetrical, which is quite interesting. So does movement symmetry even exist? That's really the question. Now, when we think of pitchers, swinging a bat, soccer, football, or even gymnastics, there is always a limb dominance or a side that is preferred. So this element of asymmetry is actually part of a lot of the athletic or repetitive movements that we do every day. Now, where this typically starts and where you will see side dominance or laterality in sports is based off of our preference for handedness and 
footedness <laughs> as we develop. And this limb or hand slash foot laterality is, of course, developed in childhood. Now, what I thought was quite interesting is that even during our gestational period, when we are developing in utero, we are still exhibiting a preference for one side of or the body versus the other. And then when we look at handedness. So handedness, you will actually see that a majority of people will prefer that right-handed dominance. Um, here it's saying 90% of people exhibit a well-defined right-hand preference um, and that a majority of limb preferences is actually postnatal. So some of it can be genetic. There's a 10 to 20% um, contributing factor of genetics in limb laterality. But a lot of other part of that is environmentally factored. Some people will probably say that some of the hand preference, that they start to promote that and push that when children start to go to school. Um, and I actually think it's quite interesting because my daughter is two years old and she is extremely talented at her level of two years old. Um, for both her left and her right hand. And she actually has a slight preference to her right hand right now. She'll use her fork and she'll color and draw. And uh, it'll be quite interesting to see the way that her pretty much symmetrical preference for handedness switches as she gets a little bit older. Now, limb preference is that you actually will start to see more of this even split that half the people will prefer the left and then the other people will prefer the right limb. And what they theorize with this, why it's different than right hand dominance, and you see this left and right leg dominance split, is that lower limb movements are actually more complex from a brain activation perspective and the way that it is coordinated. So you have this higher level of brain processing when it comes to lower limb movements and what's happening. So I thought that that was quite interesting. But regardless of the dominance or the prevalence of right foot versus left foot, we as an individual do have a footedness. And it is determined based off of what foot would you use to kick a ball. So whichever foot that is, or if you were with your feet together, which foot would you step forward? If you were going up the stairs, which would you step forward with first? Then that would be your footedness. So there is a preference. So preference in limb or laterality and this dominance is, like I'd said before, an important part or a necessary part of athletic performance and really movement efficiency. Now, where I put the position on the table is, is where then does limb dominance or lateral dominance become a little bit too much and potentially injury, a, a injury risk factor. So let's take a look before we get into um, gait and some other movement patterns Yes, we know that there's a laterality to pitching, to hitting a baseball or swinging a racket, to gymnastics. Which leg are you going to step forward with first? Which one are you going to kick with if you were a martial artist? Let's step away from that and let's actually look at bilateral movements. So if we have a laterality or a lateral dominance in a, a sport or a pattern such as throwing a ball, what then happens in the case of what would be a quote unquote symmetrical movement pattern such as a bilateral squat, running, walking, cycling, does asymmetry exist in those movement patterns as well? Or does dominance exist in those movement patterns as well? And what they see, what the research has seen in bilateral movements such as a bilateral squat is that there is still this dominant limb that we are subconsciously recruiting more power and force from one leg versus the other. And what they see in the research studies is that there's an average 15% difference in power output from one leg versus the other. Now, 
Why do we see that? Is there something that is contributing to that? These are all the questions that I pose. Could this be potentially increased if someone is status post a ACL repair? So there is this antalgic shift to the more dominant or non non-surgical limb that is actually skewing this more than that average 15%. And if we have an average 15% difference of limb dominance during a bilateral movement, at what point is that too much that we start to see compensation and transfer stress? So now these strength imbalances that we see could possibly affect the athletic performance, of course, increasing the risk of injury, you have more power and force going through it. So is there more joint stress, more joint wear? Does it then transfer up into the spine and into the pelvis and the way that you recruit some of the muscles or the wear and tear of joints and connective tissue? Absolutely, right? Now, from a cycling perspective, so bilateral squat, we will still have a preference for a limb. 15% is average of what they see in the research. And again, a lot of that is just from limb laterality in general. So this preference for one limb, when you are not in a bilateral movement, you still will carry that laterality into that movement. We all have a stronger limb. And then again, anything beyond too high of a point, do we start to see some of that injury risk? Now, if we look at cycling, Again, a symmetrical, a you know, seemingly symmetrical movement pattern where you are on you know, a symmetrical pedal stroke, is this a movement pattern that is often symmetrical or do these asymmetries and limb dominances and uh, laterality transfer to cycling as well? And what they see is that similarly, Pedaling asymmetry appears to be related to limb preference, but you can actually reduce that limb preference as you increase the pedaling workload. So depending on the level of work required, you might actually be able to balance out some of that pedaling asymmetry or that limb dominance. Now, the average asymmetry that you see within that pedal torque ranges between eight and nine percent. So we're seeing kind of that average from a bilateral squat was sitting around 15 percent. Cycling, you're seeing it right eight, nine, probably 10 percent. Now, knee moments are higher in the preferred limb, whereas hip movements were higher in the non-preferred limb. So in your dominant limb from a cycling perspective, there was a increased knee moment, whereas in the non-dominant limb, it was more of a hip movement. And what the research studies show is that training muscles across the hip joints were suggested as effective to minimize or avoid limb asymmetry during pedaling which is quite interesting. So making sure that you are finding balanced hip flexion, glute, hip, those power muscles of the lumbopelvic hip complex to try to maintain that optimal pedal symmetry. Now, if we look at running as an example, running symmetry or asymmetry, again, it is a movement pattern that theoretically could or should be symmetrical, one step leading to another step, one stride leading to another stride. Now here, running foot asymmetry. So a lot of the research around running symmetry or asymmetry actually had to do with the foot and the relationship with the ground reaction forces. So if you're looking at lateral differences and ground reaction forces greater than 5%, one limb versus the other, you actually start to see this increase of load over the tibia, which could then lead to, or what I see in my office is a increased stress fracture risk. So anytime I have a runner that comes in and gets stress fractures on one side versus the other, immediately my mind goes towards running asymmetry 
or ground reaction force asymmetry. And then of course I ask myself, well, why is that happening, right? Why do we have this asymmetrical load or dissipation of ground reaction forces of the left side versus the right side? Now, what the research has shown or seen or was studied in the research is that a lot of the running asymmetries was tied to asymmetrical subtalar joint motion. So the eversion and inversion, the pronation or the supination. So if you have increased pronation on one side versus the other, that is what they're seeing as an asymmetrical shock attenuation. Now, they happened to research shoes and orthotics as the way or the strategy to creating running symmetry or running foot ground reaction force dissipation symmetry. Of course, there's many other things that can contribute to this, but I just thought that it was another interesting side of things. So if we are taking a step back and saying, okay, we have these movement patterns or sports that by design are limb dominant, tennis as an example, there's going to be a handed preference in tennis, baseball the hand you throw in uh, basketball, the leg you lead with in gymnastics, right? So there's some of that, those assumptions. But then looking at symmetrical patterns such as running, cycling, squatting, that we see asymmetries transfer into those movement patterns as well. Now, limb dominance, laterality, and asymmetry in movement is common. Now, why is it common? The reason that it's very common is because having a limb dominance and having a more powerful limb is actually quite energy efficient. So using the power of one side is allowing this optimization of energy transfer. And until it reaches a certain point, does it actually contribute to injury risk? Now, I, I kind of think of asymmetry in movement kind of like Goldilocks, is that you don't want to have none. You don't want to be completely symmetrical because we are not symmetrical. We have handedness, footedness, and there is potentially this advantage to having a more dominant limb. So you don't want to be completely symmetrical, symmetrical. And then you don't want to be deviated all the way on one side that you have too much of that asymmetry. So we want to find that perfect balance. So as you are listening and the way that I think of this from a movement specialist perspective is that if I have an athlete that has a lateral dominance because of their sport, tennis, baseball, pitching, gymnastics, all of that, that what can we do to try to create a balance of stress. So if I'm constantly rotating to one direction, I'm doing a medial rotation on my right side every time I swing the racket or I throw a ball or I punch and I have this repetitive rotation, can I simply introduce the opposite movement pattern just to create a slight balance in stress to the connective tissue and to the joints versus believing that I am going to achieve this perfectly symmetrical, balanced movement pattern, which I would argue does not exist. The other way that I like to think about it is, is there an advantage potentially to an athlete in certain sports to not have such strong limb dominance, meaning soccer is an example. And the research actually supports this, that in soccer, as a sport, as an example, where the 
individual is very footed dominant, right foot dominant, right foot dominant, almost to the point that they are weakened or less coordinated on the opposite limb because they favor the one side. Is that an athletic hindrance because of in the heat of the moment and in the game, if something occurs, they would never be able to use the other limb because they are so dominant on one side. So the research actually shows specifically with soccer and children is that if you train the non-dominant limb, you actually create a little bit more balanced um, limb preference that they could go back and forth, almost like someone who's ambidextrous, right? That we don't want too, too, too strong of a limb dominance, especially in children and motor development and skill development, but then using the non-dominant limb. You could probably also argue that non-dominant limb training is also very brain activating and is a great way to drive neuroplasticity and to challenge motor skill development, especially with age, which is always great. Children, age, or illness are really great opportunities to do that. So when you think of symmetry or asymmetry in movement is we want to find this Goldilocks, so not too much and not too little. Train the non-dominant side. Of course, they're going to have a limb dominance. So now that then takes us to this thought of too much asymmetry. So for this, I'm going to be talking about walking. And I do a lot of gait assessments. I pretty much do a gait assessment, a walking assessment on every single one of my patients. And what I'm looking for is to have the perfect amount of asymmetry that they're not going to stress the joints or have compensation patterns or be highly inefficient. So the most common asymmetrical gait patterns are going to be those that start to fall under neurological gates. So someone with MS, Parkinson's, cerebral palsy, stroke, neuropathy, foot drop. You could even say that there's a transient gait asymmetry in someone who is using crutches, has a cam walker, is status post knee surgery, foot surgery, hip surgery, right? So we have this antelgic gait that is also a gait asymmetry that is going to start to trigger transfer stress potentially in these individuals. Now, with these being our common gait asymmetries, or even take the antelgic gait, if you want to think about that. Some of the characteristics when we get gait asymmetry is that we're going to see the individual walking slower. So they're going to start to slow the gait down because of the complex events that are happening during a normal gait cycle is if we have an asymmetry, we're gonna to try to slow it down and potentially try to correct the asymmetry within our gait. And in order to do that, you have to slow down. Now, as soon as you start slowing down or you lose the normal sinusoidal rhythmic pattern of walking, you start to become less efficient. So part of gait efficiency is built off of the rhythmic nature of walking. And that is from the heel strike on one side, rolling, absorbing, storing it in the connective tissue, and then releasing it as the opposite limb is essentially going into their heel strike. And then you're repeating this. So it really is a pattern of cyclical rhythm momentum that is sinusoidal. Is how you want to think about it. Now, if one side is moving sinusoidal and because of foot drop on the opposite limb, I'm going to be doing something on my dominant side or the non foot drop side to then compensate for what's happening on that other side. And then it's going to disrupt that rhythmic pattern. So 
anytime we have a gait asymmetry, we're oftentimes going to see shorter steps. They become staccatic. So staccatic steps are kind of how you, I call it how you walk in a short distance. So if I'm going from the car to into my house or into the grocery store, it's very different than how I would walk if I was in a wide open space and picking up my pace to this momentous state. The way that we walk around our home is very different than how we were really evolutionarily designed to walk a distance. So shorter stochastic steps, when you have these stochastic steps, your cadence is going to increase. Another key characteristic of gait asymmetry is that you have less center of mass control. The less control that you have over your center of mass, obviously you're gonna have a fall risk. Um, same thing with the slower you walk, you're actually a fall risk. If you take shorter steps, you actually have a fall risk. So gait asymmetries are classically associated with less control, less stability, higher fall risk. Now, the marker that you can use to assess gait efficiency is going to be what's called a walk ratio. And that is taking a step length over step frequency, and that's gonna be your walk ratio, okay? Now, some of the common types, so not causes, the causes of gait asymmetries are oftentimes neurological or injury could fall under that as well, or post-surgical is going to be this escape gate is what it's called. And it is essentially you spending more time on the dominant leg to get off of the non-dominant leg. So where the asymmetry would lie on a gate assessment, and if you have technology to assess a gate assessment, what is often measured is contact time. So contact time or single limb support mid stand support is going to be asymmetrical and you actually want them to be symmetrical. Same, similar, right? So the amount of time that I am on my right leg, I want to be the same as the left leg. When you do an escape gait or an escape limp, you will actually pick up the non-dominant leg quicker than you should. You go into an early heel lift and or an early swing and you pick it up and then you spend more time on the dominant leg. What that oftentimes can lead to is um, higher ground reaction forces, increased exposure to ground reaction forces, increased uh, stress fracture risk, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, knee stress, uh, all the way up into SI joint hip, uh, kind of lumbopelvic hip stress because of higher load, higher force, higher body weight, higher time to exposure to these things. A sickling gait is also referred to as a circumduction gait. And that is where someone will pick up their leg and then swing it around. So there's this abduction of the limb out to the side, and then they swing the leg around. Oftentimes you'll see that in neurological conditions, um, stroke, MS, foot drop, um, and someone will either pick up a sickling gait or a circumduction gait or a steppage gait. And a steppage gait is a very hip flexor dominant. As their leg is behind them, they're going to bend the knee and hike the hip up, hike the leg up. So they're walking, I'll just try to show you, and they'll pick the leg up and then come forward. So instead of swinging the leg through like this, they're going to do an exaggerated pickup of the leg. The circumduction, just so you see that, they're going to swing the leg out to the side. So there's this abduction of the leg. Now, I know a lot of you are movement specialists, physical therapists, body workers. So then that's where you're going to see gait asymmetries and asymmetrical recruitment of muscles is if someone is sickling their leg around, right? They're going to get this over recruitment of one side dominant glute medius, right? Piriformis, those muscles that are bringing it around and then start to get imbalances, trigger points, um, potentially bursitis is kind of on that lateral side of the hip. And then similarly, they're spending more time on the dominant side. So the injury you see may be in the dominant side, even though 
it's the other side that has foot drop and that they're sickling around. In a steppage gait, you're going to see a lot of hip flexor dominance over recruitment of the um, hip flexors and the quads, the anterior muscles as they try to pick the leg up. And that's because they do not have enough um, lower foot muscle strength to actually pick up the foot. So they're picking up the whole leg versus picking up the foot. Um, and that's their compensation pattern. From an efficiency perspective, of course, that is going to be very inefficient because they're doing this exaggerated movement, whereas gait should be very rhythmical. Trendelenburg, we're of course familiar with that one, I'm assuming. Uh, Trendelenburg is where you drop the hip to the side. So you exaggerate, if you're picking up the leg, you're gonna drop the hip to the side as you bring it up. So it's kind of this exaggeration movement of your uh, lumbo-pelvic hip complex in the frontal plane, okay? Now, if you have someone who has a gait asymmetry or a movement asymmetry, but specifically we're talking here about um, the walking, when you increase speed, similar to the cycling research that we showed, is that when you increase work output, pedal workload, the asymmetry started to level out to a more symmetrical pedal pattern. Similarly, when you push and you force the recruitment of the other limb by picking up the speed, you can then start to create a little bit more symmetry between the two limbs. Similarly, when you walk uphill, you kind of have no choice but to force this increased recruitment of the non-dominant limb because you're just <laughs> you're going to leave it behind if you do not get higher recruitment of that non-dominant limb. So uphill, faster walking speed, and then the one that's probably the research most are split belt walking. So split belt treadmills that is forcing the recruitment of the non-dominant side, saying like, you have no choice. If you want this belt to move leg, you have to work. And then it starts to create more of that forced. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting about our nervous system is that it likes to be not lazy, but if there is this dominant side that's willing to do the work, it's going to let it do the work, right? So sometimes forcing that non-dominant side to work is really important. Okay, which is kind of, you know, if you have an injury and you have muscle atrophy saying like, no, 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 I'm not going to use the dominant hand or arm. I'm going to force myself to do these things with this atrophied hand or arm because I need those muscles. I'm going to force those muscles to recruit. Okay, which if you do that and you force that side to recruit and activate and strengthen and work. That's also where the nervous system is really intelligent is that it is based off of survival. So it will find a way, okay? Now, another way that you can improve gait symmetry is through a crouch gait, which um, I thought was quite interesting, but it takes away the requirement of the foot and ankle muscles. And in a lot of these neurological conditions, such as Parkinson's stroke and as cerebral palsy, you get a lot of atrophy and weaknesses and imbalances in the foot and ankle muscles, which means they lose plantar flexion strength. So their ability to do a heel raise and really release that power from the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia, that's lost in a lot of these neurological or asymmetrical gates. So by crouching down, kind of the way that a primate walks, wearing black is not the best thing, but crouching down. So I'm doing a crouching pattern. I'm bending my knees. I'm flexing at the hips, if you can see. And then that's how I'm going to walk, okay? That allows me to be balanced in my hip muscles because these are less affected in neurological conditions where it's going to be more distal muscles that are affected first. So crouching down allows them to find that symmetrical gait pattern. Okay. And then I just already mentioned this one, forcing use of the non-dominant or the injured limb is very important. 
Now, kind of building off of that for how you can use this information in your practice is perhaps you're working with athletes that have a lateral dominant sport and you just want to try to create a little bit of a reset in the opposite side. Great. That's how I think you should do it. You want to avoid excessive limb dominance so that it's not a weakness if that athlete is ever exposed to the requirement of using the opposite limb. So doing non-dominant limb training, I think that that's great for athletes. It's also great brain training for athletes. It's great brain training for every single one of us. So, you know, using the opposite hand to do something, um, using the non-dominant limb to do an exercise first and then going to the dominant limb. Brain training is beneficial for everyone. Now, for those that are working with those that are either post-injury because of a, a limb dominance or movement asymmetry, or are working with movement disorders or post-stroke or neuropathies or foot drops or anything like that, is that an important part of what you wanna think about in trying to create movement symmetry, even though movement symmetry doesn't really exist, but how do we help our clients move to a more symmetrical movement pattern, okay? Is they have to have the perception of their movement in the first place. So this would be saying if someone is moving asymmetrically, and has no idea that they're moving asymmetrically, it is very hard to help them find movement balance when they're disconnected from the perception of their self, which is everything I speak about through Navoso. So we need to assess our clients, our athletes, our patients, and just say, what is their movement perception in the first place? not even the complexity of their walking perception, but just standing here. What is their postural perception? What is their basic controlled, maybe a squat perception or a lateral arm raise perception? Do they have the ability to feel symmetrical arm movement in a lateral raise, or are they kind of like this and think they're balanced or equal? right? So starting with that, kinesthetic awareness, proprioceptive awareness, mechanoceptive awareness, joint position sense, do they have that? Okay. Is there an awareness of their feet and their weight distribution of one limb versus the other, the front of the foot, the back of the foot, right? So you want to start there. Then as they start to go into their movement patterns that are asymmetrical, then at what point can they perceive that? And typically you need to have a certain level of asymmetry to be able to perceive that. And for the listeners here, some of you might have a really high level of kinesthetic awareness. Um, so outside of Naboso and being barefoot and always being around compression and vibration and texture. So I'm very much into proprioceptive awareness. Um, my background is that I was a gymnast and being a gymnast, you are forced to have very high kinesthetic postural motor awareness and perception. So I am, even before Naboso, always thinking of how I am sitting, standing, distributing my weight, walking, are my feet turned out? Am I hyper? I have a very high level of awareness, um, maybe to a fault. <laughs> so, but you want to kind of start there, right? So with that asymmetry, at what level can your client actually perceive it? So if you're watching your client walk and they have a slight foot drop, do they even feel that? Do they see that? Do they know that? Do they know when they go from a heel toe and switch to a toe heel because of that foot drop kicking in because of fatigue? Depending on the level of proprioceptive or kinesthetic awareness, they might need a certain level of asymmetry to actually perceive it. And as soon as that asymmetry becomes greater and greater, the transfer stress, the injury risk, the inefficiency becomes very high. So what can we do 
to help our clients, our patients, athletes improve their perception of movement. So this is, of course, where Naboso and everything else that I love to speak about would come into play. Okay, Taking your client's shoes off, getting them into their bare feet, training them on harder surfaces, using the Naboso mats, the Naboso insoles, getting them into minimal shoes versus thick cushioned shoes, using compression apparel. I actually love using compression apparel from sleeves to the shirts, to the pants, to the calves. So just helping that compression, a little hug to the body helps you feel where your body is in space. Using weights, so a wrist weight, a weighted vest, ankle weights, or holding something like the sensory sticks in your hands. You feel that proprioceptive resistance on your joint capsules can help improve your perception of limb movement. Okay. Um, so just, I'm going to take a step back for a second about that. So if I have a wrist weight on, or I'm holding the sensory sticks in both hands and walking, I might now actually feel that I'm not moving my left arm, right? So many of my patients, when they walk, I'm like, do you know you don't move your left arm or your right arm, right? Do you know that you actually don't rotate your upper body at all and you're walking kind of like a soldier who's super stiff? No, like, I have no idea. I didn't know I didn't swing my left arm, okay? That's a example of a gait asymmetry that is not high enough or they don't have high enough movement perception. It's one or the other, right? Their perception or level of perception is not matching that level of asymmetry. So to help them feel that their left arm is swinging or not swinging, holding the weight in their arm and having them you know, feel the resistance and the texture in their hand will then say, oh, okay, I actually feel now that difference in how the lack of left arm swing is actually stopping my rib cage from moving. And it feels like each step I take is not the same length as the other one, right? So that's an example of how you could use the weights for that, okay? Kinesiology tape is great because it allows you to also tape and kind of activate this proprioceptive system in a subconscious way that helps them connect to their body and to connect to their movement. Everything that you want to try to do through gait, symmetry or asymmetry really should be in this sensory subconscious way. Um, I actually saw two patients, um, yeah, one yesterday, one today, where both of them said that part of their uh, goal or their strategy to fix why they were getting foot and ankle pain is that they were trying to consciously change the way that they were walking. And the thing with walking is that it is a subconscious movement pattern that is rhythmic and momentous based. So you cannot consciously change the way that you walk. You can consciously focus on a fragment of time during the gait cycle, but you can only focus on one fragment in time at a time, if that makes sense. Okay. Which means that if you are going to try to consciously change your gait, and my client or my patient today actually said, I was slowing my gait down to try to make it more symmetrical. And I almost said to him, did you know I'm doing a webinar later today on symmetry? Because it was so perfect for what I'm speaking about right now that he actually said, I'm trying to make my gait more symmetrical because I can see in the mirror that my left foot is pronating more than my right foot. My left ankle bothers me. My left knee bothers me because I have this asymmetrical flat foot or pronation that he can see and feel and identify with. And then he feels that that is then creating an asymmetrical gait, which it is, right? 
But then, of course, I told them that you can't consciously do that, right? So this is where what can we provide to give subconscious reminders or control or stabilization? How do you trigger the stabilization of the foot faster during the gait cycle so that they're aware and you get these movement patterns that you don't consciously think about because it's not possible to do so, okay? And that's one of the most important things that I encourage you to think about is when you're trying to find more symmetry, again, because we're not perfectly symmetrical, having the perception of that asymmetry is important. The perception that the T-spine is not rotating the same on one side versus the other. The perception that one shoulder is dropped more than the other. Perception and awareness to me by the patient or the client or the athlete is the most important step one. And then that's where you come in and you use your skills to try to create balance in that client or athlete. Now, as we go into any questions that you may have, um, I do want to share a brief video. This is 15 seconds. So do not worry. It is not anything long as 15 seconds about the Naboso socks that we just launched for anyone who's tuning in and you order them. Guess what? They just arrived and they're all shipping out tomorrow. Um, if you are in another country, those will start shipping. Those are shipping now to Europe, Australia, and Asia. So those will start shipping out the end of the month or first thing in January, but you can see the texture. Oops, where's the camera? in these socks. I'm going to show you this real quick. And then after this, I'm going to take any questions that you may have. We got texture, we got compression to feed both aspects of the nervous system. And they're intended to be worn end of the day, after a long workout, when you're lifting, when you're doing your rehab exercises, put them in the shoe, bring that stimulation to help build that foot awareness as just another way, another product that Naboso tries to help you improve perception in your clients, athletes, and patients. So that what you do to try to create balanced movement, as balanced as we can achieve, possible. Okay. I will happily take any questions that you may have. And then for everyone who did sign up, you will be getting the recording, a PDF of this PowerPoint, so you can reference back on that, and then several research articles that were used in the development of this presentation. So you will get that Dropbox folder. Okay, so I'm going into some questions that you may have. Let's see. Uh, so Bill says a lot of people have one hip more dominant than the other. How would you correct this? So yes. So just to kind of recap on that, and that's a great question, is hip dominance, glute dominance, quad dominance, foot dominance, whatever it is, if you're trying to find more balance away from this laterality, it is to train the opposite limb, to force recruitment of the opposite limb. So Bill said, should I be doing single leg exercises? Absolutely, right? Because if you have no choice but to recruit the glute on, let's say your left side through a single leg exercise, it has no choice but to work. So then that is one of the best ways to try to create balance in that environment. So great, great, great question. Uh, Diana says, is there any research about decreasing asymmetry by using mental imagery to activate the limb that is less dominant? That is a great question. Um, so I actually do not know the answer to that. However, there is research that shows that visualization and mental imagery does create muscle recruitment and activation. So that is quite viable that you could do that. Um, if you can do it in a setting where you just visualize activating or putting resistance on a limb and you get muscle motor neuron activation, I would assume that you could start to train the, the less dominant side. Great question. Um, Emily Park says, how's the texture of the sock compared to the insoles? 
Unfortunately, you can't compare them because they're completely different materials. <laughs> so it is our pyramid pattern. All of the Naboso products have the pyramid pattern. So you can see obviously the pattern on the sensory stick, two point discrimination pyramidal pattern in the socks. You have two point discrimination in a pyramidal pattern. All of the pyramids are the same height, but they're slightly different materials and durometers, which is why I can't exactly compare apples to apples with that one. Sorry, Emily. Um, now the question is, I have a client who has uh, neuropathology FS, FSH induced foot drop, okay? And she has a job where she is on her feet all day. I've encouraged her to use the Naboso insoles, but I'm wondering if the socks can be used all day as well instead. Uh, yes, absolutely. However, what I would say is to have her use them at home first to get used to them, to understand that she's comfortable with them, how they feel. And then of course you can increase your time on them. Perfect, great question. Uh, let me see here. Andrew says, fascinated by symmetries, doing a lot of research, love your Goldilocks approach, especially with asymmetrical sport athletes. There are also many symmetries to explore besides bilateral symmetry discussed here. Every action has an opposite reaction. So there's a symmetry between breathing in and breathing out. Absolutely, 100%. Um, between sleeping and walking, flexing and extending, uh, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, this view of symmetry can apply to almost any movement. So it's interesting to apply the Goldilocks approach to these other versions of symmetry. Would love to hear your thoughts uh, or inspire for the research. Uh, absolutely. So um, the, the Goldilocks, yes, of not having too little or too much. There's this sweet spot. And then Andrew, just real quick, the first thing that comes to mind as far as symmetries, um, in breathing in, breathing out, quads versus hamstring, plantar flexion versus dorsiflexion. I always try to find rhythms in movement, meaning uh, you're dancing back and forth between a movement. So when you inhale and exhale, it is this rhythmic dance back and forth to find that sinusoidal pattern as well. Um, now, one part that I did not go into because it just was not the focus of this uh, webinar is that there is a lot of research around quad versus hamstring symmetry or asymmetry. That's another way you could use this word or exactly as Andrew said, dorsiflexion of the ankle versus plantar flexion of the ankle and asymmetries in that. Um, I think that that would be another topic that I could do. Um, but just so you know, that use of the word symmetry or asymmetry um, was not what I did in this one, but perfect idea for another one. Um, what if you train barefoot? How will the socks come into play? So Bill, the way that I would use the socks is going to be in a form of recovery. So if you train barefoot, you wear minimal shoes, I like to think of the socks as just that mini massage. Actually, these <coughs> stimulate circulation. So one of the big perks of foot health and foot longevity is that you wanna increase circulation to the feet, uh, micro circulation to the feet because that supplies the nerves, the vessels, the skin, the fascia. Um, it's how we recover. So that's where you're going to use this as well. So even though you're barefoot, you get that added benefit of increased skin perfusion and uh, vascular perfusion with the recovery socks. Okay. Um, Lisa asks, can you speak about the lack of initiative in movement with Parkinson's and how music creates an increased cadence and symmetry in gait? Uh, so Lisa, that is a great question. I am not... Um, a Parkinson's specialist. However, you do see that music and dancing and things like that take away the hesitation in initiating movement that is typical within Parkinson's. Um, we also saw through using the Naboso insoles and the plantar sensory stimulation that that oftentimes in individuals also minimized 
that hesitation in initiation in movement. Um, for Lisa and then for everyone who's listening, is if you are not familiar with Carl Sterling, he has an education course that's called the Parkinson's Regeneration Training. Um, I believe that that's his website, but if you just Google Parkinson's um, Carl Sterling, he would have great, great, great information. We actually work with him at Naboso and he uses our products. And then he travels all around the world speaking about Parkinson's fitness and Parkinson's rehab. So he would be your go-to source. Um, what I am sharing from Naboso is on behalf of seeing the response of our customers with Parkinson's. Um, and then we're actually doing a research study with Hartford Healthcare in Connecticut, and they're doing a Parkinson's research study with the Navoso insoles. Okay. Um, can using Navoso products help to train clients to reduce asymmetrical patterns which result from structural sources such as scoliosis? Um, the focus of the Navoso products would be to bring the perception of that asymmetry to the forefront. That would be my answer to that. Is it correcting the asymmetry of the scoliosis? No, it's bringing that perception of the asymmetry. Perception is the first step. And then from the perception and the awareness, they can do certain things to try to minimize the asymmetry and the transfer stress. Okay, um, perfect. I hope that that answers your question, um, Jay Jones. Great. So we have just one, let's see, one more question. Um, Emily says, sorry that she's repeating, but she goes, I'm just asking, are the socks appropriate for neurological conditions? A big old yes, Emily. <laughs> yes, yes, yes to that. Perfect. Great. I'm just going to check one more spot. Okay. Excellent. Great. So no more questions, but don't worry if you thought of a question, just email us uh, at Naboso. My personal email is dremily at naboso.com. For everyone who has tuned in, you will be getting the PowerPoint, the recording, and some research articles. I hope that you enjoyed. Thank you so much for supporting our webinars, so much for supporting Naboso and every Thing that we put out. Um, please know that we do work with a lot of resellers. So if you're interested in recommending this to your patients, athletes, your network of clients, you can either resell or become an affiliate for Naboso. Or if you just send a friendly, hey, go to naboso.com. We always appreciate that. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and I will see you on next month's webinar. Take care.